We're in Luke chapter 24. That's our text. And the title of the message is What the Resurrection of Jesus Means to Us. I heard a story about a man that went uh, to Israel on vacation with his family. And he took along, along with his wife and kids, his ever nagging, very difficult to deal with mother-in-law. Well, while they were there in the Holy Land, his mother-in-law suddenly passed away. So they were trying to figure out what to do with the body. So he contacted a local undertaker and asked him about it. And the man said, well, sir, you can have her shipped home for $5,000 or you can bury her here in the Holy Land for $150. So the man thought about it for a few moments and said he would like to have her shipped home for $5,000. The undertaker said, sir, why would you spend $5,000 to ship your mother-in-law home when you can bury her here in the Holy Land for $150? Come on, that's a great deal. And the guy said, well, you know what? A long time ago, a man was buried here, and three days later, he rose again from the dead. <laughs> and I cannot take that chance. <laughs> Remember, it was his mother-in-law. Sorry, mothers-in-law. <laughs> but you know what? You just cannot ignore the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It changed human history, and it can change your history in future as well. Because Jesus died and rose again from the dead, we as his followers have hope. Now, I didn't always have that hope. You know, before I was a Christian, I had no hope to speak of. In fact, I was very disillusioned because of the way I was raised. You saw some of it in the Lost Boy film. But the adult world for me did not offer a standard I aspired to. I saw emptiness in their lives. I saw them chasing effectively after nothingness. And I had no hope. And it was my belief as a young kid that when you died, you simply ceased to exist. I did not really believe that I had a soul. I didn't believe in an afterlife. And that sometimes I would just sit around and think about the idea of no longer existing, just ceasing to be. And I have to tell you something, that just terrified me. And that kind of thinking is nothing new. In fact, 400 years before the birth of Christ, the Greek philosopher Socrates drank the poison hemlock and lay down to die. One of his disciples asked him, Shall we live again? And the dying philosopher could only reply, I hope so, but no man can know. You know, the oldest book in the Bible is the book of Job. And in that book, Job asks the question, if a man dies, does he go on living? This is a big question that we ask now in the 21st century as well. What happens beyond the grave? Is there really an afterlife? And if so, do I have any say-so as to where I will spend eternity? Well, this is where the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ comes in. Because Jesus both died and rose again from the dead, that means that we as believers do not have to fear death. Now that doesn't mean we have a death wish. It doesn't mean that we walk around and say, man, I hope I die today. What it does mean is if this is our last day on earth, we do not have to be afraid because of the death and resurrection of Christ. And this is why this is one of the essentials of the Christian faith. In fact, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus are the most important events in all of human history. And this teaching of the Bible on these topics is not a peripheral issue. It's not a secondary subject. It's foundational. It's the bottom line. Why? Because the resurrection of Jesus sets our faith apart from all others. You can go and visit the graves of various teachers and gurus and religious leaders today and pay your respects. But if you go to the tomb of Jesus, you will find it's empty because he's not there. He's risen. He's alive. And that is an important distinction of our faith. And this is something that we cannot fudge on. This is something we cannot negotiate on. This is the bottom line. Because if the foundation of our faith is flawed, then our whole house is going to come crumbling down. Psalm 11.3 says, If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Earlier in this series I quoted C.S. Lewis and I want to return to that quote for a moment where he says, 
if you do not listen to theology, that will not mean you have no ideas about God. It will mean you have a lot of wrong ones. And so this series that we are doing that we're calling Essentials uh, really is theology without apology. Because theology is the study of God. And I can't think of anything better to spend our time studying. And what we believe about God and what he says about life affects everything that we do. And that is why Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.16, watch your life and your doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you'll save both yourself and your hearers. These truths that we're talking about are so important because there's going to come a day when our life is going to come to an end. And these will not be secondary issues. These will not be things that we'll just sort of toy with. We'll be asking, okay, what is going to happen to me now? Or when a loved one of yours dies suddenly, you're suddenly going to come face to face with these issues and you're going to want to know more. I've never thought about heaven so much in my whole life as a follower of Jesus. I've been a Christian for 35 years. Actually, probably more than that. I've been married for 35 years, so probably been a Christian for about 38 years, I guess. Maybe four. I'm not sure. But um, <laughs> someone has to do the math and tell me how long I have been a Christian. <laughs> but I'll tell you, in the last nine months, I've thought so much about heaven. Uh, I've studied heaven. Uh, I've wanted to know more about it for obvious reasons. My mother's there. My father who adopted me is there. Many of my friends are there, and now my son is there. I want to know about these things. The, these are the most important things to think about right now. Not what's going on in the economy. Not who's in the White House. Not, no, these things have their place. But eternity, these are the big issues we need to think about. And we have to make sure that we understand these things and believe the right things. Because if Jesus did not rise from the dead, as some would suggest, then our faith is bogus because it's at the foundation of what we believe. In fact, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, I passed on to you what was most important. And what has been passed on to me that Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said, he was buried and raised again from the dead, just as the scripture said. Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 15, 12, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is useless and your trust in God is useless. So let's think about this. And this will help you to understand why the devil has attacked the resurrection of Jesus with such fervor over the years because the resurrection of Christ spells a defeat of Satan. There are people today that will say, uh, I don't even know if I believe Jesus existed. And by the way, for a person to say that is the most idiotic thing of all. Because it is the most documented historical event ever. For Pete's sake, we divide human time by it. And, uh, and not only are there the biblical sources to substantiate this, but there are secular sources as well. Uh, other historians that wrote about it, like Josephus. The point is, there's no question that a man named Jesus lived, and there's no question that a man named Jesus died on a cross. That, too, is substantiated by history. But Satan attacks the resurrection of Jesus, and people will say they don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus, and I don't think they say it because they've carefully studied it and found there is no evidence to support it. I think the reason they reject the resurrection of Jesus is the same reason they, re they reject the idea that God created the world and God created humanity. Because if that is true, that means that, first of all, there is a God, and it means that we are not just an animal or evolved from lower life forms, and it means that we will indeed be held accountable for our actions, and frankly, some people don't like that idea. And the reason they'll reject the idea of the resurrection of Christ is because it says to them the Bible is true and the scripture tells us in Acts 17, 31, God has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He's given proof to this by raising him from the dead. And this reminds us that God's justice will ultimately prevail. So people come up with theories. Theories to disprove the resurrection of Jesus. Have you heard some of these theories? Let me give you three of them. 
Number one, there's the swoon theory. How many of you have heard of the swoon theory? The swoon theory proposes that Jesus did not actually die, but he went into a deep coma or a swoon from the severe pain and trauma of the crucifixion. However, this theory says, in the cool atmosphere of the tomb, somehow Jesus revived and was able to get out of the strips of cloth wrapped around him and then appear to his disciples. People actually believe this. Now this theory is so absurd, it almost doesn't even merit a response, but let's just consider the events that led up to the crucifixion. We know that when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, Dr. Luke tells us in his gospel that Jesus sweat as it were great drops of blood. Uh, many believe that this may be what uh, modern medical science refers to as hematidrosis. Hematidrosis is a rare condition that one experiences when they are under extreme stress and they will actually perspire blood. Uh, and at this point the tiny uh, capillaries and the sweat glands rupture mixing sweat with blood and as a result the skin becomes extremely fragile. Then Jesus is taken. He's beaten repeatedly. He's flogged 39 times with a whip replete with razor sharp bones and lead balls reducing his body to quivering ribbons of bleeding flesh. As Jesus slumps in a pool of his own blood the soldiers throw a scarlet robe across his shoulders and press a crown of thorns deeply into his scalp and then they take the scepter out of his hand and begin to beat him with it. Jesus now at this point in critical condition has a 300 pound cross placed on his shoulder and he carries it through the city where he is then laid on it and seven inch iron spikes are driven through his hands and feet. Waves of pain pulsate through the body of Christ as the nails lacerate his nerves. Breathing is agonizing as Jesus is hanging on the cross and the sin of the world is placed upon him as he cries out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, or my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Having completed his mission, Jesus says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And Jesus then dies or expires. To prove he was indeed dead, a Roman legionnaire drove his spear through Jesus' side and from the wound, we read, rushed blood and water, proving that Jesus had died uh, or had suffered fatal torment. Uh, John 19.34 says, One of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and blood and water came out. A first century John would uh, most likely not have known what medical science has only recently discovered, namely that blood and water flowed from the side of Jesus due to the fact that the heart is surrounded by a sack of water called a pericardium. The water came from Christ's pierced pericardium and the blood came from his pierced heart. One expert said, and I quote, even if Jesus were alive before he was stabbed, the lance alone would have certainly killed him. Interestingly, the Roman guards were the first ones to report that Jesus had died. And understand this. They were experts at execution. These Roman soldiers executed thousands of men and they knew when a man was dead. So for the swoon theory to be true, Jesus would have had to survive all that I have just described, the massive loss of blood, the scourging, the wounds, the spear thrust, Besides all of this, he would have had to, in an impossibly weakened condition, endure 40 hours without food or drink, manage to unwrap himself, single-handedly remove the massive stone closing the tomb, and then convince his followers that he had risen from the dead. He would have to travel countless miles in that condition and make many appearances to his disciples over a 40-day period, including appearing in a room uh, and not using the door. Now this theory is so absurd, but yet people will conveniently hang their doubt on it. There's even liberal ministers out there today that would propose such a theory. I read about a person who wrote to a local advice columnist about what their minister had said, and they said to the advice columnist who was, columnist who was known as Eutychus, they said, Dear Eutychus, our preacher said on Easter, Jesus just swooned on the cross. And the disciples nursed him back to health. What do you think? Sincerely, bewildered. Uh, Eutychus responds, dear bewildered, 
beat your preacher with a cat of nine tails, with 39 heavy strokes, nail him to a cross, hang him in the sun for six hours, run a spear through his heart, embalm him, put him in an airless tomb for 36 hours, and see what happens. Sincerely, Eutychus. No, I don't think the swoon theory is too believable. But there's another one that I find laughable. It's called the twin theory. This is a real theory that some believe in. This theory says, I'm not making this up, Jesus had an identical twin brother named Haram. And according to this theory, Haram is separated from Jesus at birth and doesn't see him again until the time of the crucifixion. But upon stumbling into Jerusalem, Haram sees his mirror image on the cross and realizes that Jesus of Nazareth, whom he searched so much about, is actually his identical twin. So Haram assumes the mission of his twin brother. Did you ever see that movie called Dave? where the guy becomes the president that looks just like the president. And uh, that, that's sort of the Harom theory. And uh, it, it's so stupid, okay? But you know, people will, will buy into this, just like they'll buy into something like the Da Vinci Code, okay? A, a, a fiction writer comes up with the most erroneous, absurd theories imaginable and people will say, well, this is shaking my faith. He may be right. And if they did even basic research on it, they would see how flimsy these theories are. But I'm telling you, people grab onto these things because it alleviates them from having to deal with the issue of eternity. The twin theory is so dumb. But probably the most commonly held theory or uh, statement that is made to explain away the resurrection of Jesus is the body's Oh, excuse me, the disciples, there's no body. The disciples stole his body. Uh, you know, they just made this whole thing up. Christianity is an invention of the followers of Jesus. Okay, now let's think about that for a moment logically. Why would these apostles want to invent a faith that would result in all of them dying a difficult death. Most of them died a premature death. How could it be that the very men who fled for their lives while Jesus was still alive could suddenly muster the courage and ingenuity to steal the body and then boldly start preaching and teaching about a Jesus they knew was dead? They all, as I said, went to an early grave for the most part. Certainly one of them would have come clean and said, we made this thing up. Think about it. We know that Matthew, the author of one of the Gospels suffered martyrdom by being thrust through with a sword in Ethiopia. Mark died in Alexandria being cruelly drugged through the streets of the city. Luke was hung on an olive tree in Greece. Peter, according to church tradition, was crucified upside down in Rome. James the Greater beheaded in Jerusalem. James the Less thrown from the temple and then beaten to death with a club. Bartholomew flayed alive. Andrew bound to a cross where he preached to his persecutors until he was dead. Thomas, who we call the doubter, was run through with a lance in the East Indies. And Jude was shot to death with arrows. If your life would have been spared, if you simply would recant and say you made it up, don't you think that one of these guys would have broke ranks with the others and said, it's a myth, it's an invention? No. They all died a martyr's death because they could not deny the proof, the power, and the reality of the resurrection. Jesus died and he rose again. And this is why he came. Jesus came specifically to die on a cross, rise from the dead. As I said in an earlier message, the incarnation was for the purpose of the atonement. The birth of Jesus was so there would be the death of Jesus. And check this out. It all happened according to God's perfect plan. In fact, Peter, later preaching to the very men who had crucified Jesus, said in Acts chapter 2, This Jesus, following the deliberate and well thought out plan of God, was betrayed by men who took the law into their own hands and was handed over to you, and you nailed him to a cross and you killed him. But death was no match for him. I'm interested in that phrase that Peter uses, God's well-thought-out plan. This was a well-thought-out plan for the Son of God to be tortured and murdered in cold blood. All the disciples could see was their master. 
their teacher, their friend, their hero, the one that they had sacrificed everything for, the one they had dedicated their lives to, was dead. Not only was he dead, but he was beaten beyond human recognition. And if you've ever lost someone suddenly, you know how devastating it could be. They're there one day and they're gone the next. Imagine the pain they felt. And those two disciples on the Emmaus Road pretty much summed up how all of the followers of Jesus felt at this point. They said, unbeknownst to them, to Christ himself who was risen and conversing with them, we had hoped that he would have been the one to deliver Israel, but it's been three days since these things happened. They used the word hoped, past tense, not present tense. Because as far as they could see, Jesus had failed in his mission. And this came as a surprise because prior to the crucifixion, everything seemed to be progressing beautifully. I mean, he rode into Jerusalem on the back of the donkey and they laid the palm branches at his feet and cried out, Hosanna, which means save now. The disciples were thinking, finally people are beginning to understand what we've known all along. This is Messiah. This is the Christ. This is the one. And then everything went off track. It came off the rails. One of their own, Judas Iscariot, betrays him. For 30 pieces of silver. And by the way, Judas wasn't as sinister as most of us think prior to his betrayal. You know, whenever you see an artistic depiction of the disciples, you always know who Judas is. He's the guy in the black robe, you know? Everybody else in white robes, Judas, black robe. A black leather robe. Wearing sunglasses. <laughs> lurking in the shadows. Looking evil. If Judas was so obvious, when Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me, all the disciples would have turned and pointed to him in unison and said, it's him, isn't it? The guy in the black robe, right? But Judas was thought of as a stand-up guy, as a good guy. But in reality, Judas was a betrayer. And Satan entered his heart, and he betrayed our Lord. And then, of course, Jesus' sweating blood in Gethsemane, He's arrested. Simon Peter, pretty much the leader of the pack, denies Jesus three times, even taking an oath and saying he never knew him. And then the Lord is brought before Caiaphas and he's shuttled off to Pilate. Then he's sent over to Herod. Then he's brought back to Pilate. Then he's sent to be scourged. And then he's executed and he's dead and he's gone. How could this have happened? But it was God's well thought out plan. God's deliberate, well thought out plan. And when Jesus uttered those words from Calvary, it is finished, that's pretty much how the disciples thought. It's finished. <laughs> the dream is over. We've wasted our lives. We made a horrible mistake. Oh, no, no. This was not the end. This was the beginning. A new beginning of a new covenant between God and man. And when Jesus cried out those words, it is finished, or tetelestai from Calvary, he was talking about the completion of something. Tetelestai, a common word used at this time. When you finished a project, this is what you would say, tetelestai. Maybe when Jesus and Joseph would work on a project together in the carpentry shop, and it finally came to completion, uh, one would turn to the other and say, tetelestai, yeah, tetelestai. It's finally done. Jesus uses that phrase from the cross. It means it is accomplished. It is performed. It is completed. It is done. What was finished? Well, for starters, finished were the horrific sufferings of Christ. Never again would he experience pain or be in the hands of Satan. Never again would he have to bear the sins of the world. Never again would he even for a moment be forsaken of God. Number two, check this out. Finished was Satan's stronghold on humanity. Because the Bible tells us in Hebrews 2.14, through death Christ destroyed him that had the power of death, that is the devil. This means because of what Jesus did on the cross, you no longer have to be under the power of anyone or anything apart from the Holy Spirit. That's good news. Because, you know, maybe you've struggled with drugs. Or you've struggled with alcohol. Or you've struggled with immorality. 
Or there's some area of your life you've tried to get victory over, but you continue to fall in again and again. You say, I can never be free. No, listen, at the cross, Jesus purchased your freedom. The prison door is open. Now the question is, do you want to walk out of that cell that you're in? I, I heard a story recently uh, about a man that was in India, and he went to a bazaar, a bazaar there, and uh, there was a, a, an individual, a merchant, who was selling doves. And he had taken 30 doves and tied a little string around uh, one of their legs and attached it to a ring that was attached to a post in the middle. And because of this, uh, all of these doves just marched around in a circle constantly. Well, this man who saw it thought that was so cruel and uh, he wanted to free the doves. So he went to the man and said, I want to buy all of your doves right now. How much you want for them? The man gave him a price. And he was given the money. And then the man who loved these little birds said, no, I want you to set them all free. And the guy said, hey, you're a dove. It's fine. So he undid that little string around their legs. And, and there they were. And guess what they did? They kept going around in a circle. And then the man shooed them away. And all the doves flew and landed over a few feet away and got right back in a circle and started walking again. You see? And that's how a lot of us are. You know, Jesus has set us free, but we just go right back to our old habits. We go right back to our old patterns. We're just kind of going around in that circle, doing what everybody else does, saying what everybody else says, thinking what everybody else thinks. When Jesus has set you free, finished with Satan's stronghold on humanity. And finally, this is a big one, finished was your salvation. Our sins were transferred to Jesus when He hung on that cross and His righteousness was transferred to your account. That means there's nothing you can do to add to the work that He has done for you. It's done. You're saved, okay? It's a done deal. So rejoice in the gift of God that has been given to you. It is finished. But they didn't understand what this meant. All they saw was Jesus dying. He, of course, is taken down from the cross. He's put in the tomb of a wealthy man known as Joseph of Arimathea. And uh, then a surprising thing happened that changed their lives and changed human history. Luke chapter 24, verse 1. Let's read it. But very early on Sunday morning the women came to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. They found the stone covering the entrance that had been rolled aside, and they went in, and they could not find the body of the Lord Jesus. They were puzzled, trying to think what could have happened to it. Suddenly, two men appeared to them, clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified. They bowed low before them, and the men asked, Why are you looking in a tomb for someone who's alive? He isn't here. He's risen from the dead. Don't you remember what he told you back in Galilee? That the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and he would rise again on the third day. Then they remembered that he had said this. So they rushed back to his 11 disciples and everyone else and told them what had happened. The women who went to the tomb were Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and several others. They told the apostles what had happened, but the story sounded like nonsense, so they didn't believe it. However, Peter ran to the tomb to look. Stooping, he peered in, saw the empty linen wrappings. He went home again, wondering what had happened. I love the way this chapter begins. It says, very early on Sunday morning. But there's another word there, but very early on Sunday morning. In spite of all that the devil and man had done, God was not done. Check this out. God will always have the last word. You see, you might be in a situation right now that looks so bleak. You've been given bad news and you think there's no hope for me. But very early on Sunday morning, after Joseph was betrayed, by his brothers for 20 pieces of silver and sold into slavery and it looked like his life had come to an end to the providence of God. He was elevated to be the second most powerful man in all of the world. And one day when his brothers came to him needing food, appearing before their brother that they thought was dead, he looked at them and revealed his identity. And then he said, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. God will always have the last word, but very early the next morning. These women come to the tomb. They're devoted to Jesus. 
They find the tomb empty, the stone rolled away, the body is gone, and there are men speaking to them, arrayed in dazzling garments. Uh, these were angels, we know, from the other Gospels. Now, I hate to break this to you, but there are no chick angels in the Bible. You know, usually when you see an angel, she's a girl, right? We'll even use that expression, she's an angel. But all the angels in the Bible, they're men. Sorry, no female angels. It's not a big deal, just thought I'd point it out to you. So these men that really are angels tell them that Jesus is not in this tomb. He is alive. He's risen. Don't you remember that he told you this thing? That he would rise again and suddenly it dawns on them. That's right. He told us that again and again and again. But they just missed the point. I heard about a farmer that went out hunting one day. And uh, he took his little dog along with him. And I uh, saw flock of uh, ducks. Is it a flock of ducks? No, flock of geese. Is it flock of ducks? What is it? Okay, flock. Isn't it weird how all these animal groups have their own word? Uh, for instance, a flock of sheep. Uh, it's uh, a murder of crow. Have you ever known a murder of crow? Anyway, so getting back to this again. Um, so flock of ducks fly by. Kaboom, he fires off a shotgun. One duck falls into the middle of the lake. And his trusty dog who would normally swim to get the duck walks across the top of the water, retrieves the duck, brings it back, drops it at the farmer's feet. His dog just walked on water. He couldn't believe it. It's a miracle. So he thinks he's seen things. So he waits for another flock of ducks to fly by, fires up another round. Duck falls into the middle of the lake. Again, his dog runs across the top of the water, retrieves the duck, brings it back, drops it at his feet. This farmer can hardly wait to impress his neighbor, Clem, who isn't impressed by anything. He gets back home. He says, Clem, you want to go out duck hunting with me tomorrow? Clem says, all right. So the next morning they're out there and the farmer sees some duck fly by. He fires off a shot. Duck falls in the middle of the lake. Again, his dog runs across the top of the water, retrieves it, brings it back, drops it at his feet. And he looks over at his friend Clem. He says, what do you think about that, Clem? Clem's kind of kicking the ground. He says, I don't think your dog knows how to swim. <laughs> Talk about missing the point. The disciples had missed the point that Jesus would rise again from the dead. He said it again and again and again. Now it's all coming to them. Oh yeah, this is part of that well thought out predetermined plan. This is what was meant to be. Jesus was alive. He appeared to Mary Magdalene of course, there at the empty tomb, he appeared to Peter. He appeared to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. He appeared in the upper room, asked Thomas to put his hand into his side if he wanted to. He appeared to 500 people on one occasion. Jesus was alive, and then he ascended into heaven and gave to his followers the great commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel to everyone. Now, Here's something to think about. The resurrection body of Jesus. He was able to appear in a room without using a door. But yet it was a physical body because he asked for a piece of fish and he ate it. But yet he could ascend. Now why do I bring this up? Because the Bible tells us that when Christ who is our life shall appear, we shall be like him for we will see him as he is so it would appear to me that our new bodies that God will give to us will resemble his resurrection body. Isn't that great to know? So what that means is will we be able to fly? I don't know. How many of you have ever had dreams of flying? Raise up your hand. That's a lot of you. How many of you have never dreamt of flying? Raise your hand up. What's wrong with you? <laughs> I don't know about you but in my dream of flying I don't, it's not like Superman, I run and, you know, like that. I just kind of lift off and I kind of cruise. Ooh, this is nice, you know. Will we be able to fly in heaven? Why not? Jesus certainly ascended at will. Another nice thing about his resurrection body, he ate. I'm, I'm happy for that. I'm glad there's going to be feasting in heaven. You're not going to just be sitting around in a cloud strumming a harp going to be a lot you're going to be involved in in heaven. And we're going to talk about that in the very near future in this series. But the point is, if God has a new body for you that resembles the body of Christ that he had, 
Because Jesus rose, I too will rise. Because Jesus died, I will never die. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. You will not die. He said, Greg, you're wrong. The cemeteries are filled with people who have died. Oh, I understand that. I understand that we will die in a physical sense. But in another sense, the real you, the real me, will never, ever die. See, that spark that makes you so special, that's your soul. And that soul will live forever. You see, death is not the end of the road. It's just a bend in the road. The road winds to the path that Jesus himself has gone. The tomb is not an entrance to death but to life. And the moment we take our last breath on earth, we take our first breath in heaven. And when Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, he conquered death. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 says, When our perishable earthly bodies have been transformed into heavenly bodies that will never die, then the scriptures will come true. Death is swallowed up in victory. So death, where is your victory? Grave, where is your sting? So, in closing, what does the resurrection of Jesus mean to us today? Number one, the resurrection of Jesus assures me that I am accepted by God. Again, the resurrection of Jesus assures me that I am accepted by God. Romans 4.25 says, He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. If Jesus had never risen, there would be no assurance that I was right with God, but now there is. Number two, the resurrection of Jesus assures me that Christ is now interceding in heaven for me. He's interceding in heaven for me. Romans 8, 34. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God interceding for us. Check it out. You're in the heavenly courtroom. You're in trouble. The judge is God Almighty, the holy, all-knowing, all-powerful God that you have personally offended. Prosecuting attorney, Lou, last name Siffer, <laughs> also known as Satan. He's shrewd, he's clever, and he knows all about you. Your defense attorney, Jesus Christ. So Lucifer stands up and says, well, today we have in this courtroom Greg Laurie. Oh, he was a preacher, I'm told. But let me tell you about the real Greg Laurie, the sinner. The man who fell short of God's standards. The man who broke God's commandments. The man who sinned. And he begins to read a list of every sin I've ever committed. I think, well, this would go for a while. But a month later, he's still reading. <laughs> I bury my face on my hands. And I think to myself, I'm so dead. I can't even look at the judge. I don't even want to make eye contact. So I look over to my defense attorney, Jesus. He doesn't seem to be too nervous. He's not upset. He's just calm as could be. And I'm thinking, well, it's fine. It's not him on trial. It's me. And Jesus turns to me and says, Greg, calm. Be calm. It's okay. I'll take care of it. Says, yeah, but Jesus, you hear what he said? Just calm down. It'll be all right. But do you hear what he said? It's all right. Just wait. So finally, Satan finishes his accusations against me which are innumerable and he says to the judge judge your own law says the soul that sins shall surely die this man has sinned way more than one time therefore you have to enact your law and punish him i rest my case he sits down jesus stands up he says to the judge permission to approach the bench bench your honor and the judge says permission granted jesus goes up to the front of the courtroom, leans in and says, Dad? <laughs> now, we both know that Greg is guilty as charged. But we also know that I died on a cross and paid the price for every sin he's ever committed. The father says, that's right. The father pounds down his gavel and he says, case is dismissed, all is forgiven. See, your representative before God is Jesus Christ. And the resurrection says that he is interceding for you. 
Romans 8, 34. Who is he that condemns Christ Jesus to die more than that? Who is raised to life is at the right hand of God interceding for you. Number three. The resurrection of Jesus reminds me I have all the power I need to live the Christian life. Let me repeat that. The resurrection of Jesus reminds me I have all the power I need to live the Christian life. The history of mankind has been the story of discovering and using power. First it was manpower. Then it was steam power. Then it was nuclear power. The only thing we seem to lack is willpower. We can harness the powers of the universe, but we can't control ourselves. But because of the resurrection of Jesus, I have all the power I need to live. Romans 8.11 says, The Spirit of God who raised Christ from the dead lives in you. He that raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal body, but the same Spirit living within you. So dear Christian friends, you have no obligation whatsoever to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. I have power now to live a new life. And one other thing I would add to this. God put me on this earth to live this new life and walk in fellowship with Him and discover His will for me. 2 Corinthians 5.15 says, He died for everyone so that those who receive His new life will no longer live to please themselves. And themselves. Instead, they will live to please Christ who died and was raised for them. Let me tell you something. If you want to be a completely unhappy person, dedicate yourself to being a happy person. Say, my goal in life is to be happy. I guarantee you're going to be unhappy. It's been said there are two sources of unhappiness in life. One is not getting what you want, and the other is getting it. You know, and you can chase after all the things this world offers and end up so empty. Here's what you need to know. If you discover the reason that God made you, which is to know Him, and to walk in fellowship with Him, and to honor Him, and to glorify Him, you will find in that pursuit of God the fringe benefit will be personal happiness. Not from seeking it, but from seeking Him. The Bible says, happy are the people whose God is the what? The Lord. When you seek God and put Him first, happiness will come. Number four, and lastly, the resurrection of Jesus assures me I will live forever. The resurrection of Jesus assures me I will live forever. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 says the fact is Christ has been raised from the dead. He has become the first of a great harvest of those that will be raised to life again. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, Adam, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man, Christ. Everyone dies because we're related to Adam, the first man, but all who are related to Christ, the other man, will be given new life. Jesus said, because I live, you shall live also. Let me close with a story from history that shows how a defeat was turned into a victory. It was June 18th, 1815, the Battle of Waterloo. The French, under the command of Napoleon, were fighting the Allied forces of the British, Dutch, and Germans under the command of General Wellington. The people of England depended on a system of signals to find out how the battle was going, and one of those signals was put on the tower of Winchester Cathedral. And late in the day, this signal was flashed. Wellington defeated. Wellington defeated. And just at that moment, a fog cloud rode, uh, rolled in and the people could not read the rest of the message. They just read, Wellington defeated. And panic spread among the people. The news of defeat uh, was quickly passed on and the people were devastated because it meant that they had lost the war to Napoleon. Suddenly the fog lifted and the remainder of the message could be read. The message had four words, not two, and the complete message was Wellington defeated the enemy. A little bit of a difference there, you see. When Jesus died, all the disciples could see written for them was Christ defeated. In their minds, our world had come to an end. In their minds, Christ had failed in his mission. But then the fog rolled away and they got the big picture when he was alive again and they realized the message was not Christ defeated. The real message was Christ.
Christ defeated death. That's what the death and resurrection of Jesus means to you. And the same Jesus who died and rose again from the dead is alive. And he's with us right now. And he stands at the door of your life and he knocks. And he says, if you will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. I'm telling you. And if you will pray and ask Christ to come into your life, you can be forgiven of every sin you've ever committed. And you can know with absolute certainty that your life is right with God and you are, as the Bible says, saved. And that you will go to heaven when you die. Is there anything more important than that? And as you listen to this message right now, do you have that assurance? Do you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that if you were to die tonight that you would go to heaven? Or do you have a doubt about that? You need to get that settled. So you can leave here tonight knowing your life is right with God. Knowing that you're ready for the Lord's return. And then you can start discovering God's plan and purpose for you on this earth, which as I said earlier, is to know Him and to discover His plan and purpose for you. If you've never asked Christ to come into your life, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that right now as we close in prayer. If you need Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sin, respond to this invitation I'm now going to extend. If you tried to fill the void in your life with all of the things this world offers, I'm telling you now about the one who will take the place of all those things and you won't need them anymore. Jesus Christ, who lived, who died, who rose, who will come into your life and forgive you tonight. Let's all bow our heads for a word of prayer as we close now. Now, Father, I want to pray for every person who's heard this message. And especially for those who may have heard it but do not yet know you. As they sit here tonight, they don't have the certainty that they will go to heaven when they die, and that scares them. They're living a hopeless life. But here you are ready to forgive them and to transform them if they will come to you. Would you help them to do that now? Help them to believe in Jesus. Help them to find your forgiveness, we pray. Now while our heads are bowed, And our eyes are closed. And we're praying together. If you want your sin forgiven, if you want to know that when you die, you will go to heaven, if you want the void in your life filled, if you want Christ to come into your life right now as your Savior and Lord, would you lift your hand up wherever you're sitting? And I'm going to pray for you. You want His forgiveness tonight. You want to know that you'll go to heaven when you die. Just lift your hand up and I'll pray for you tonight. God bless you. Just lift it up where I can see it, please. God bless you over there. God bless you. God bless you as well. You're in the middle. God bless you. Over here on the other side, God bless you too. You know you need to get right with God tonight. I think that you are here because God wanted you here to hear this message. Excuse me. And this is your opportunity to respond and have that new start in life you've been wanting. Anybody else? You want Christ to come into your life? Let me pray for you tonight. Just lift your hand up if you want His forgiveness. God bless you. God bless you. Maybe there's some here tonight that you were raised in the church and you've heard this your whole life, but you've gone astray. You've gone back to the old life again and You're a prodigal son or daughter, but you want to return to the Lord tonight. You want to get right with God tonight. You don't want to be a backslider anymore. If you want to make a recommitment to Christ, would you lift your hand up right now? And let me pray for you. You want to come back to the Lord tonight. God bless you. God bless you, young man, down here toward the front, over here on the side. God bless you, you. Lord, thank you now for each one of these. I pray you'll give them the strength to stand up and follow you and receive all that you have for them. We ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen.